Okay. First off, I know you talked about this earlier today, mm -hmm. but you know the thing that you had said about you know what the foundations of quantum mechanics say as to you know there's a couple of things obviously the observer you know right. where does the observer fit in you know and the the hook or non-hook of, of consciousness in that right and um, so if you could talk about that and you know the probably more like this than like yes this. yeah um, <clears throat> Something that happens in quantum mechanics, um, one of the important innovations of quantum mechanics is that a certain fantasy uh, that held in physics up until then about the possibility of observing something entirely passively, observing it without affecting it in the process of observing it, <clears throat> However things turn out, it's fairly clear now that quantum mechanics will have ended that permanently. Um, um, looking at things involves interacting with them, and it involves interacting with them in a way whose effect can't be minimized. Um, no matter how delicate your technology is, uh, no matter how much money you spend, um, uh, so, that's a new feature of quantum mechanics. Okay, this is getting too long. Um, I take it this is going to be edited so I can stay stuck yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. Now, now are, were and, you saying by that, though, that, but, that they found now that the observer has no effect? No, well, no. So, no. The, 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 um, the process, the physical process of making a measurement has a very profound effect. There have been a whole bunch of speculations in the literature as to what it is about the process of making a measurement that has this effect and how it is that the process of making measurements have the effects that they do. One of the speculations about this, which, was, which had its heyday in the 50s and 60s um, um, in, the, in the scientific and philosophical literature, was that the active agent here was consciousness. And people were excited about this for all sorts of obvious reasons. It was a, a very new sort of link between physics and something that had seemed altogether outside of physics up until then. Much of the talk in quantum mechanics that goes on in the film is centered around these speculations. And one of the points I wanted to make this morning was that um, those speculations haven't played a role in what I regard as the serious scientific and philosophical literature on this subject for 30 years or so. There was a certain period where people were speculating like that. There was, as I mentioned this morning, a series of progressively more and more embarrassing conversations of the form, well, can a, can a cat um, um, cause these effects with its consciousness? Can a mouse cause these effects with its consciousness? Eventually, it was clear that the words involved here were so imprecise, were so slippery, that you weren't going to be able to build a useful scientific theory around them, and the idea was dropped. It's also the case that even if those ideas had turned out to be useful and true in physics, um, um, they wouldn't have produced the picture of the world that it seems to me we get in What the Bleep. Um, um, even if consciousness was the agent, all of these theories had the operations of this consciousness regulated by very strict, external, concrete, soulless, mathematical laws. The, the jump from the involvement of consciousness, even if it was there, to these larger claims like I create my own reality, I choose my experience, consciousness is the foundation of all being, there's room in the world for this intangible phenomenon of freedom, so on and so forth, these wouldn't have followed even if the consciousness picture of measurement had succeeded, and the consciousness picture of measurement didn't succeed. Um, so those were the points I was trying to make about that this morning. I mean, these are all points in a negative vein. Um, <clears throat> um, there, there is the positive thing to say is that there's a huge amount of interesting work going on over the last 20 years trying to understand how measurements do cause the effects that they cause. This work is all in a vein 
that in the language of this film would be called much more um, mechanistic, uh, in the vein of a much more mechanistic picture of the world. Um, this work has to do with trying to figure out how to alter the equations in order to produce these changes um, um, or how to add things, add physical things to our picture of the world in order to, in order to show how these changes come about. They're not at all centered on issues of, of the possible agency of consciousness anymore. So the, the thing about the measurement, is right. it, are, do they look at that now as sort of that the measurement is, is a coupled system with the thing that they're trying to measure? Yeah, that? There, there, is, there is something that's really, you know, if you want to put your finger on one of the profound philosophical shifts between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, it's the classical mechanics is built from the ground up around what we now know is a fantasy of the possibility of observing things passively, okay? Or the possibility of, at least if you get more and more careful, more and more and more closely approaching the position of observing things in a perfectly passive way. Observing things in such a way that you're sure that you're not in the process of observing something, changing the very thing you're trying to observe. Quantum mechanics put a decisive end to that. This phenomenon of incompatible observables that I was talking about this morning makes it very clear that measurements, that there is a minimum and finite disturbance that you're going to have to cause to any system by measuring um, any particular one of its physical variables. And there is going to be no way, no kind of technological advancement that can reduce it below that definite finite level. Mind you, everybody always knew that in order to measure a system, you have to interact with it physically in one way or another. But like I say, the fantasy was that you could make this interaction more and more and more and more delicate as your technology got better. Quantum mechanics put a decisive end to that. Quantum mechanics gives us a theoretical, unsurpassable, finite, minimum interaction which you must have with the system if you're going to get any information out of it. That's a very decisive change. So this picture of passive observation is gone. Like I say, it was a tempting move in the context of a discovery like that to say, well, what do we mean by observation? What is it that's doing the disturbing? It was a natural thing to grab at something like consciousness. Um, observers have consciousness, so on and so forth. There were other things that they grabbed at just as instinctively. Macroscopicness, the macroscopicness of the measuring apparatus as opposed to the microscopicness of the measured object. Um, um, the, the cut between subject and object. There were all sorts of things to grab at. Consciousness was one of the things that was grabbed at. Um, it was grabbed at very tentatively. It was, it was in fairly short order followed up to the point where it looked like a dead end insofar as the progress of physics was concerned. And it hasn't played a role since then, except in certain attempts to appropriate quantum mechanics to, to other kinds of agendas, new age agendas or deconstructionist agendas uh, or post-structuralist agendas or so on and so forth.